So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. So the topic of our webinar is a little different from um, the webinars that we have been offering so far and kind of like, you know, uh, extends beyond our, 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 our webinar series to basically discuss how we can leverage uh, the two actually, you know, a new type of grants that we that we have related to environmental justice and how we can leverage this funding to essentially promote um, equitable development. Um, my name is Nefeli Bomboti. I pretty much know the majority of you already uh, since we've worked together on, you know, multiple projects. Um, I'm a research professor here at UConn and I also serve as the program manager for, for UConn Tab. And today I actually have uh, two, uh, two uh, new collaborators uh, from the Environmental uh, Protection Network, Jasmine and Kaya, that will be um, talking a little bit later on about the technical assistance that uh, EPN, the Environmental Protection uh, Network, is also offering to communities. With that, I'll get started. So for today's webinar, essentially, I will be giving a short overview of our services uh, through Yukon Tab, and then we'll be talking about the new environmental justice uh, grants that are available to communities and also local governments. And then I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Jasmine to um, um, go over her slides on the environmental protection protection network uh, uh, services and technical assistance. At the end, we have some time built for a Q&A where you can uh, unmute yourselves and just ask questions or you can put your questions into the chat. I'm recording the webinar, so uh, you can always, you know, go back to the recording um, at the end and uh, we'll be uploading this on our website together with uh, the slides from, um, from this presentation. So uh, our, our program, the Technical Assistance for Brownfields program uh, for uh, EPA Region 1, essentially uh, you can find the majority of the information on our website. So if you click on the tab.program.ucon.edu, you'll see the, the types of services that we are offering to communities together with uh, resources like templates and other information, relevant, relevant information on Brownfields redevelopment. Uh, just to briefly introduce our team, our program director, Professor Kusoku, uh, myself, um, Dr. Randy Mendes, um, Dr. Rupal Parekh, who is the community engagement lead, uh, Dr. Sarah Wakwai uh, uh, as our public health expert, and Dr. David uh, Dixon as our um, um, uh, director for uh, Center for Land Use. Essentially, our team is a very diverse team in terms, in terms of uh, expertise. Uh, all of us work together to serve communities across New England. So we basically serve uh, all six New England states, um, uh, working together with uh, communities, including uh, right municipalities, right town and cities. Uh, but we also serve um, nonprofit organizations. Uh, regional planning commissions or other regional organizations, and of course, states and tribes. As an overview of our services, uh, mainly um, we focus on uh, providing direct technical assistance to communities, and I'll, I'll be uh, talking a little bit more about that. We have our um, uh, uh, our municipal assistance program where communities participate to receive assistance on, on Brownfields redevelopment on various projects in collaboration, in coordination with our course activities here at UConn. Um, our continuing education program where we offer webinar series, uh, webinar series and workshops on different topics and of course our community engagement actions. In terms of direct technical assistance, you can always reach out to us if you have a question about the technical document. We summarize previous environmental site assessment reports or uh, remedial action plans or planning documents. Uh, anything related to uh, anything, let's say, of technical nature around brownfields, we can, uh, our team can basically provide um, the readers, let's say, digest or uh, the summary of, the, of those documents for uh, essentially, you know, for the public. 
uh, a, a, a big component of our services include uh, includes reviewing proposals for uh, brownfield grants. So if you're planning to submit an EPA brownfield grant uh, proposal in the near future, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you with um, putting together uh, the, your application package. I mean, we cannot write the proposal for you, but we can help with some of the components. And of course, we can provide an extensive review an extensive review and feedback on your draft. Um, and of course, um, we also help with um, state program proposals. So, if you're planning to apply for a state grant, we can also we can also help with with that. Uh, access to resources, for example, example, well, I'm sorry, example proposals and documents, and um, for for instance, um, uh, templates for procurement documents, RFPs, RFQs. Uh, we will be happy to share those with you. Uh, and of course, if you have specific technical questions about, you know, your uh, about a, a specific project, you can always reach out to our team, and we can set up a consultation and a one-to-one -one consultation to uh, go over um, the specifics of your project. Our municipal assistance program, and this is kind of like a unique program that we have here uh, at Yukon Tab, uh, because we do have the the courses that we offer at Yukon, so uh, have access to the students uh, that they're really motivated and want you know want to um, actually work on hands-on projects. So essentially, we uh, offer this municipal assistance program three times a year um, in the Fall semester from September to December, essentially the main activities of the program focus on the EPA Brownfields grants. So that the marks grant support essentially stands for multi-purpose assessment, revolving loan fund, and cleanup grants. Uh, that again, you know, is uh, for EPA Brownfields grants, where the students work with communities on uh, different aspects of the proposal, including summarizing demographics using age screen and drafting some of the sum summaries for, for uh, the site descriptions. Uh, during the spring semester and the, uh, the summer session, uh, we do offer um, assistance on technical projects, including brownfield inventories, collecting data for brownfield sites, um, doing a data, uh, data review and gap analysis for particular properties, drafting um, scope of work for site investigation, uh, site reuse planning or site reuse assessment for particular properties, and of course, community engagement planning and materials. So the, for the spring semester, our deadline has passed and we actually, you know, we are currently have taken um, a dozen of projects uh, that our students are working on. But the summer will uh, essentially open at, in the beginning of April. So if you're planning to apply for um, our summer program, um, we'll be releasing the RFP in the beginning of April for a start in May. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye on the on our newsletter for uh, for the release of the RFP. And with that. Um, I would like to introduce the topic of our webinar today, which is really equitable development and how we actually, what are the uh, the other actions that we can uh, support in our community to support our communities uh, so that we uh, have healthy and sustainable uh, communities that are uh, that have a more holistic uh, approach on. Um, uh, when it comes to let's say uh, development, and the discussion will be uh, uh, will be extended beyond brownfields redevelopment because brownfields is one part of the equation. Essentially, you know, controlling, for example, sources of pollution, brownfield sites, um, redeveloping brownfield sites, kind of like you know, solve one part of the of of the puzzle however there are many other aspects within the community right we, uh, many other aspects that we can actually um support for example uh promoting public health or uh focusing on um preparing actually uh um uh, for um 
essentially, you know, the, the effects of climate change um, by doing actions for like climate resilience and adaptation, focusing on water quality, making sure that our stakeholders are engaged and have the necessary information to be engaged into the public dialogue. And of course, um, uh, implementing uh, energy efficiency and energy uh, renewable energy uh, measures within, you know, within the community. And when we think of all those different aspects of health and sustainable communities and how we can actually um, make the make this more equitable, um, we think about communities that are particularly in need, uh, meaning communities that have been disproportionately impacted in the previous years, so focusing on communities that have been um, uh, are essentially underserved and disadvantaged. And when we think about those communities, essentially we refer to communities that have been systematically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life. So the new type of grants that we um, that the federal government uh, has has issued. So those are two types of grants coming from EPA refer essentially to tackling environmental and public health issues on uh, underserved and disadvantaged communities. So we have two types of programs of uh, the scope of the programs is similar. However, the eligible entities to receive the grants are different. So the first program is available to community-based nonprofit organizations or CBOs. So you're gonna see a lot of acronyms. I'll try to mention to spell them out as I as I as I speak, but sometimes you may you may hear me say, oh, the CBO. That stands for the community-based nonprofit organization. The first program is the Environmental Justice Collaborative Problem Solving. So that is the EJ CPS. So I will refer to this as a CPS program, where um, a, a nonprofit, a community based nonprofit organization, is the eligible entity to apply for this grant to mainly address an environmental and or public health problem where the community essentially will be taking the lead on. The second program, the Environmental Justice Government to Government Program, so that is the G2G program, that is available for states and tribes and local governments. So, but of course, we'll go into the specifics of like they do require partnership. Uh, but essentially, the eligible entity to receive this grant could be, for example, the local government. And knowing that uh, you are most, I mean, from, from, um, from what I saw in our audience today is mostly um, you're most municipal officials, so I would think that this is a more of a, like applicable program for the purposes of the town. If you represent a nonprofit organization, then uh, the CPS would be a more applicable program for you. So essentially, the G2G program uh, ha also has a similar scope in terms of like tackling, again, an environmental or public health issue within the community. So it doesn't have to do with brownfields. It doesn't have to do specifically with, um, let's say, a source of pollution. It could be a broader problem. So um, this would be something that uh, you could, for example, identify within your community as an environmental or public health issue and request funding for that. And we'll be going over example projects and example uh, and what kind of like, you know, topics that you can actually include there. So to summarize a few important things here with respect to the two programs that we have. The CPS, as I mentioned, is available to nonprofit, community based nonprofit organizations. Partnerships are not required for this program, but are strongly encouraged. Uh, and if you're partnering with somebody, with, with another entity, you will need to have a letter of commitment. Uh, and also, uh, you will need to actually assign um, a sub award. Some of the partnerships might not have a sub award, but um, uh, when you do have a sub award, that needs to be reflected also in the letter of commitment. The 
funding available for this program is uh, $500,000. And they actually have set aside, so this is the award ceiling, essentially. You can request up to $500,000. Uh, and they have actually set aside uh, a, a number, uh, some funding for uh, smaller, um, uh, smaller nonprofit organizations where they can request up to $150,000. And what they mean by smaller CBOs, they refer to CBOs that have less than five, I, I believe less than five employees, if I remember this correctly. They plan to award 83, um, 83 applications and uh, the distribution between the 500K projects is they plan to award 50 of those projects and 33 of the smaller ones. For the G2G program, where states and tribes, uh, state instrumentalities and local governments are eligible to apply. Uh, however, there is a main requirement for a partnership with a community-based organization. So if you're planning, if you are, uh, if you represent, for example, you know, a municipality and you, you want to apply for this program, you will need to partner with a CBO to be eligible for that. So they really want to have this partnership with community based organizations. And uh, that would also need to, uh, to reflect sub award, um, at least one. The, it's strongly encouraged to have at least three partnerships. Uh, but they do require at least at least um, one. And again, you would need a letter of commitment with sub award information. The award ceiling for that is $1 million. So it's a big chunk of money. There is plenty of things you can do with a million dollars. And they plan to award 70, um, uh, 70 proposals. And that those numbers are nationwide. Uh, so 83 for the first one, 70 for uh, the G2G program. Any questions so far? Anything that you'd like to ask with respect to kind of like the numbers and the logistics specifics, let's put it that way here. The deadline for the applications um, is Actually, it's not approaching, but uh, it's uh, it's essentially in a month and 10 days. So it's, that's in April 10th. Um, and uh, the cooperative agreement, the start day of the project will essentially be um, in the next fiscal year, which is essentially in October 1st, starting October 1st of 2023 with a period of performance for three years. So uh, if you're planning to apply, have in mind that you know the proposed activities would have to start October 1st and then you would have to spend the funds within the next three years. Now, in terms of uh, environmental or public health issues that you can actually target with this uh, programs. So mainly uh, we have kind of like, you know, three different categories. I mean, in the RFA, they do specify these are as five main categories, but I have kind of like consolidated them, like merged them according to the, to the topic there. So in, when it comes to, for example, pollution prevention, monitoring and remediation, the type of, the types of prog of, of environmental, let's say issues have to do with um, air quality and uh, reducing, for example, asthma. So, and that applies to actually, you know, all, all also active facilities. So, for example, if you have a school, right, that, um, or if you have um, any other, like, you know, public facility that there might be an environmental issue, you can definitely include that into the application. Uh, the other part has to do with water quality and sampling. You can propose to do sampling and perhaps monitoring if you have, for example, a particular uh, environmental issue, for example, PFAS or an emerging contaminant. Uh, you could suggest sampling activities for water, water quality purposes. Lead contamination, that is um, actually... Uh, uh, um, let me go. My laptop is going to die. I'm sorry for that. Um, so lead contamination, uh, if uh, you have a facility, even active facility that uh, you have building materials that might be hazardous 
right with like lead based paint you can definitely request funding to do a survey and also to do abatement for the particular facility especially if there is a public health concern for example you like schools as i mentioned that is we we've seen a couple of those examples of like you know schools that uh, have building materials that are hazardous and uh, there is a significant public health concern right that they need abatement uh, and repair illegal dumping uh, if there is kind of like hazardous waste within the community small community cleanups you can also request fund funding for that healthy homes and pesticides and other toxic substances uh, when it comes to climate resilience and adaptation a projects on stormwater and green infrastructure, emergency preparedness and disaster resiliency, uh, food access to reduce vehicle travel and fuel emissions. So those are some of the topics that you can actually um, request funds for. And um, the third part has to do with the engagement of the community. So engagement and also education. So you, you for example, um, is of interest to your community, you could uh, request funding to uh, launch a job training program or um, engage uh, the youth into uh, environmental justice topics. So um, all of those topics are eligible. Um, I wouldn't say eligible. I would I would say are topics that are that it would be a good fit for 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 the particular uh, for those particular programs and if you're thinking that in your community you do have some of those issues that might be a good fit for you uh, some example projects that fit within um, the the previous topics that I mentioned of course uh, since we're talking about environmental justice um, the the project have to be right in a community where there is a need Right, where there is an environmental, uh, there is environmental injustice, or where there is a community that has been, you know, underserved or um, disadvantaged. So, the project that you're proposing has to needs to have an impact in this community. So, some of the example projects here, and I'll I'll, I'll go through this list, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, so, for example, if you're thinking of cleaning up illegal dumping, right, and on hazardous trash, uh, reduction of lead, we talked about this, um, developing a citizen science monitoring program, or uh, planning um, and development of heat island mitigation strategies, uh, that has to do, again, with climate resilience, uh, equitable transportation, uh, improve equitable transportation to encourage walking, biking, uh, and public transportation, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy programs for schools, um, developing EJ map tools or other methodologies to determine potential impacts to those communities. Uh, emergency preparedness, as I mentioned, with respect to uh, developing plans to minimize exposure to pollutants uh, from like different disasters, uh, monitoring prevention and remediation of air quality issues um, and remediation of uh, waterborne pollutants as well. And of course, establishing like communication strategies between um, state agencies and local governments. And again, has to do with essentially um, outreach to the community, engaging the community in the public dialogue. Some example uh, activities that are, are eligible under both programs. Uh, essentially, you can, and I have highlighted some of them that are more related to um, to. Uh, pollution or um, hazardous waste management uh, and essentially uh, and of course I mean the, the list could go beyond that I'm just highlighting a few things here that might be of of, of particular interest so for example small-scale construction and demolition you can also do uh, some demo work if that is necessary for the project and for the D2G program, that is something that, of course, doesn't apply for the CPS program. Uh, you could also um, um, purchase, 
uh, so land acquisition would be essentially an eligible um, activity there of if it, that is of smaller scale. So if you have something in mind, a particular property that the town um, uh, might want to actually, you know, um, acquire, you could also budget funds with respect to that if, if that is of smaller scale. Uh, with the intent of like, of course, for example, cleaning up the property, right? So it has to fit within the, 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 the broader scope of the program. Uh, other activities here, for example, you know, remediation of lead or asbestos. I have highlighted this here because it's again, uh, very relevant to uh, hazardous building materials for schools or other other public facilities or other uh, buildings that um, that and that that could be very expensive. So that is something that you can actually you know target. Monitoring sources of pollution again that might be relevant to for example monitoring if there is uh, emerging if there are emerging contaminants um, in the in in groundwater in 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 your town perhaps you can request funds to actually monitor uh, like sample and monitor those um, those sources of pollution uh, and of course uh, doing revitalization planning for um, addressing local pollution in green space. So that also has to do with the equitable development that I mentioned in the, in the, in the beginning. One particular consideration with respect to the, those programs. So um, both programs mention the, that doing a health impact assessment, uh, and I don't know how familiar you are with, with those type of studies, are actually a special consideration under both uh, programs. Um, so the health impact assessments are essentially studies where they identify the potential effects of a proposed environmental decision. So, for example, if you're planning to change, um, let's say, you know, um, change the policy to change to uh, have uh, a plan or implement a new program, what is going to be the effect of this decision? on the health of the underserved and vulnerable populations uh, that might be using, for example, that might be affected by that environmental decision. Um, and honestly, from my experience, I haven't seen a lot of those studies, but it would be um, actually, I think it would be interesting to, um, to, to see more of those when it comes to, again, uh, planning for a new environmental project, see what is going to be the impact of that project to the community. And have included here an example uh, with a link from a previous study of what they actually did for um, a school, for a public school in Massachusetts, where they had multiple issues within the school. Uh, and they did an, a health impact assessment study to determine that impact to the community and it, it was actually an active, an active school. So within the different renovation options that they had identified and the different environmental solutions that they actually had proposed, they came up with a score that essentially was showing what is, gonna, what is the effect um, when it comes to respiratory health, um, to the classroom acoustics, right? To actually, you know, using the classrooms there, the community's perception, and they kind of like ranked each one of those uh, options according to the effect of uh, to the effect that they had in each one of those categories. So um, that is something to actually consider under the. Um, under those grants, I mean, this will be an eligible activity if you, you know, if that would be of, of your interest to do this kind of like studies. Um, and I'm just bringing it up because uh, it's also relatively new to me. Uh, and I think it's of interest to see, to actually be able to quantify uh, the effects of our, you know, decision making, right, to actually, you know, the, the community. In terms of your application packages, I mean, they are for both applications. I mean, they're pretty much the, uh, the same. They have a few differences. And if you have applied for an EPA grant before, um, EPA typically requires uh, a couple of like forms in addition 
to the to the proposed narrative. So essentially, for both programs, you would have to include, for example, the application for federal assistance, the SF-424 uh, form, the budget, the key contacts, uh, the pre-award compliance. And then, of course, that would go together with your work plan, which is the project narrative. And for the purposes of those programs, that is an 18 page uh, work plan that you would have to uh, prepare. Within the RFA, there is a template that you can actually use and kind of like follow EPA's guidelines to prepare that. It's a very long application. I know it takes time. Uh, so hopefully, you know, within a month and 10 days, that would be something that you can actually, you know, put together. And besides those five items here, there are other attachments, for example, that you would need to include. For example, if we go over the G2G program, because I feel that this is might be more relevant to uh, the audience here, for example, you could uh, you would have to include budget, right? The environmental results, letter of commitment from your partnership, from your partners, and the resumes of the project manager and key personnel. So, I mean, the application package is definitely, you know, a big like, chunk of work, but they're also offering a million dollars. So, uh, it's kind of like, you know, perhaps it's, it's worth putting in the effort. Uh, in terms of, um, of course, EPA has kind of like a ranking system of how they rank the applications. So, the work plan um, has different sections with different points assigned to each section. Uh, I haven't including the detail, the detail point breakdown breakdown here. That is all in the RFA. I just wanted to mention one thing with respect to uh, the section that corresponds to identify the need, essentially the issues within the community, where they actually. Um, Assign 12 points out of a hand. I think it's out of the hand run, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, 12 points towards this section. And they strongly, strongly suggest to use EPA's EJ screen tool to find the demographics. Uh, if you haven't used EJ screen before, it can be a little difficult to navigate the tool. Uh, so our program is actually offering a short course on EJ screen that is available on our website. It's for free. Uh, you can register and uh, take the short course um, it's just for a couple of hours and we will guide you through the EJ screen tool and how to actually, you know, um, take the data and kind of like, you know, draft your narrative with respect to the need. We've done this for the Brownfields grants. However, there is a similarity between uh, how you can actually, you know, use uh, EJ screen to basically draft the need for the EJ grants as well. So essentially, you would have to pull together demographics, socioeconomic indicators and environmental indicators for the census blog group and the census tract where the, the project is and draft your narrative uh, around around the 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 data, and with that, uh, I'd like to actually um, pass it on to my to my partners from the Environmental Protection Network. Let me stop sharing so that you can share your screen, uh, Jasmine. Absolutely, thank you, Nathalie. I'm going to. Uh... Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, let me know if you guys can see it okay. Can you see this all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, go ahead, Jasmine. Perfect. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Nefeli, for having us. We really appreciate your time. I'm Jasmine Wilkes with the, Envir with the Environmental Protection Network. If you want to move to the next slide. Thank you, Kaya. Um, so the Environmental Protection Network, we were founded in January of 2017. So we've been around just for a couple of years. Um, our network consists of 550, oh, over 550 former EPA workers across the country. They volunteer their time. <laughs> You're all good guy. They volunteer their time to protect the integrity of the EPA, um, human health and the environment. 
and um, they give a unique perspective of former, of former regulators and decades of historical knowledge and subject matter experience. So within the Environmental Protection Network, we have a pro bono technical assistance program. The purpose of this program is to bridge the divide between communities and government. Um, so this includes former engineers, scientists, lawyers, permit writers, um, and communities and the nonprofits who support them. And we also serve under-resourced state, local, and tribal agencies. Within our pro bono technical assistance program, we like to navigate regulations, uh, data, policies, and funding opportunities. And the goal is to achieve tangible public health benefits for all. There are many types of assistance that we provide. So um, just to name a few, um, document translation into lay language, helping communities understand things to their level, um, navigating regulatory and grant programs, identifying individual contacts at agencies and connecting groups with others and sharing lessons learned. So our progress to date, this is just uh, a little bit of our data that we have. So far, we have engaged with 111 unique volunteers across 218 communities, organizations, and law clinics. We have responded to 258 inquiries, and we have made 587 connections with our volunteers, and we have helped groups access over $3 million um, in funding, and we anticipate exponential growth, especially since we have been hiring new employees lately. And um, to get to that, we have brought on five new staff and more to come. So going into our Brownfields technical assistance, just a couple examples are listed here. Bayview Hunters Point, the Sustainability Lab, CCLR, a bunch of law clinics and Columbia Riverkeeper. And just going back really quickly, um, these are the community outreach associates. Kaya Williams, who is on this call, is the, is the senior community outreach associate. Then there's Davina Resto working in regions five and seven. Jamie Zwaszka working in regions nine and 10. I'm working in regions one and two. Michelle McKelly, who's working in region six and eight. And Sierra Celia Farrell working in regions three and four. So there are and for every community outreach associate, we work with two regions and we hope to expand so that every community outreach associate has their own region. And this is just a visual representation if you don't um, work in EPA region brain. Um, so I'm over here in the corner working with the uh, Northeast and New England area. I also work with Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Then there's um, Celia Talia Ferro, who's working with Regions 3 and 4. There is Davina Resto, working with Regions 5 and 7 in the Midwest. Um, Michelle McKelly, who's working with 6 and 8 out in the uh, Midwest as well. And Jamie Zawashka, who's working out in the West and those territories over there. And we also do public affairs work. So this is uh, Stephen Fontes. He works as a resource to press in NGOs. He focuses a lot of his work on recruiting and, re and retaining greater diversity at EPA, and he has a lot of partnerships with HBCUs and MSIs across the country. And on our policy side, this is Michelle Montoya. She facilitates EPN's issue teams. Um, a lot of her work focuses on submitting formal comments and letters, and she advances progressive national policies and educates Congress on um, anything going on. So going back into a little bit of the topic and the purpose of this entire meeting, um, the EPN Grant Writing Assistant and Review, we have been heavily focusing on the EJCPS and the EJG2G. Um, we have been focusing a lot of our work on assisting groups with registration for SAM.gov, Grants.gov, and receiving a unique entity identification, UEID, which is different than an EIN. Um, and just for awareness, EPN will be hosting office hours this Thursday, tomorrow, March 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 1 p.m. PT to answer any questions and walk through the initial processes. So if you have any questions about SAM.gov or Grants.gov, we will be there on the Zoom to provide any answers or any, clarif any clarifying questions. 
Uh, we will be sending out additional information, including templates and instructions on Monday, March 6th. But in the meanwhile, we highly recommend that you complete both registrations by this Friday, March 3rd, just so that we can, um, you know, all have some space to help each other out. And if you're interested in the uh, office hours, we can send the link in the chat or we can send it elsewhere. But yeah. And I believe that's the final slide. But again, I'm Jasmine. I'm one of the community outreach associates. My email is there. My number is there. I will also put it in the chat. And Kaya Williams is also on this call. She is the senior community outreach associate. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. And thank you so much, Nafeli, for um, holding space for us to speak. Thank you both. Uh, and uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. If uh, we have any, feel free again to unmute yourselves and just, you know, uh, we're a small group. Yes, Jill, I see your your hand. Um, thank you. That was very informative. I have two questions on these um, grants. Is there traditionally a community match? And if so, how much is it usually? There is no co-share uh, for for this type of grants. So um you, you don't you don't have to provide uh, uh, a matching uh you don't have to provide matching for the to request the the full amount of money okay and then my second question is this an annual program um is it anticipated to be an annual program or is it just this year hmm. so that actually i don't know kaya if you have more information on that um yeah. as far as we have heard um I'm not sure if it's annual at all. Um, they haven't mentioned it being annual, so I'm assuming it's not. I will also add, we didn't put in the um, slides that we are helping groups um, with partners, find partners. Um, hey, Bray. We're writing, um, we're helping by writing, assisting groups write with those templates so that it can basically generate the application on its own. And then in terms of the final review and um, feedback, our volunteers who are former bureaucrats, a lot of them were the ones who either helped create or um, start these programs and have reviewed and accepted past applications. They're gonna be providing feedback and review for all of our groups that, um, anyone that really reaches out to us. So, um, thinking about how they are actually funding those programs, I mean, those programs are not entirely new. They have been, you know, they exist for years, but they were of like smaller scope. So, for example, the uh, problem solving collaborative program that existed for a couple of years. So they have a list of like previous projects, but this year, because of like additional appropriations and uh, also, I think it's not the infrastructure uh, law funding, uh, but is the reduction act that they is actually you know providing uh, more additional funds towards the EJ office. That's why they have the increased number of awards and also increased increased um, funding requests. I'm not sure if this year, if next year, we're going to have that much funding available. So I would definitely think that it is a good opportunity to apply for this this year. Um, and inflation reduction, exactly, exactly. So, um, so going back to the reviews, Kaya, so you mentioned that you are, I mean, you are accepting also applications for for review from communities nationwide, right? Yes, we are. We um. So we are kind of taking a few different tracks. Um, the first track and first step we're taking is that registration on SAM and Grant.gov to get their unique entity. Um, I believe it's like number or identification number. Um, and then from there, starting on Monday, we're going to begin to reach out to all of the groups. Um, who we have helped register or who are already registered prior to us reaching out to begin the process to actually writing the grants. Um, and then the final process will be matching all of those groups with different volunteers, um, as well as a few other groups who already had grant writers to our volunteers to get that feedback, that review, that advice. Um, and it's, it's completely up to um, the groups in terms of what they submit. It's just a moment to gauge um, feedback and hear what I don't know, from a former bureaucratic perspective, if they have a good application and if they think it is likely to get accepted. And for our program, because I mean, 
we are tab right so that i mean our program is um oriented uh, you know towards brownfields and that program the ej grants extend beyond that we don't currently you know support reviews for this type of grants but of course we'll be happy to help and you know connect you with you know the environmental profession network that they are actually you know offering this type of like you know pro bono technical assistance and Jasmine's email and phone number are also in the chat, so you can also feel free to reach out to us directly, either via email or on our website. Um, any way you connect with us, we're happy to help. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I did want to say last week um, they actually extended the deadline to April 14th, only four days. They, and they actually updated the guidance um, and they, they put together like a, I think one page of what they updated. They clarified a few things, but then they also postponed the, um, the grant start date by like a month or two. It's different now for each of the grants. So I just thought I randomly came across it. So I thought I'd let you guys know. Oh, wow. thank you. I actually didn't even realize that we're like immediately Jasmine and I ran to our work group chat to ping everyone. So thank you so much. You're absolutely right. I also missed the, the extension. So I apologize for for giving you the previous deadline. Um, I also missed the the, the new updates. That is actually a relief. So thank you for sharing. It gives us four extra days, which isn't much, but you can get a lot done in four days. And I appreciate this presentation. It was really interesting and I didn't realize what um, the Environmental Protection Network all did and that you guys served areas in the whole country. So that's really great. I plan on connecting with some of the communities I work with and I'll get them in touch with you guys. Thank you. I'll make sure I'll update the dates uh, on the well, slide so that. I was going to say, well, meeting. thank you for having us. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, and thank you uh, to our guests uh, today, Kaya and Jasmine. Uh, and again, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free um, to reach out to us or uh, reach out to Jasmine and Kaya directly. Uh, would be happy to uh, help you as much as possible with, you know, there's so much funding available out there. Uh, hopefully, you know, our communities get their share. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye.